Hello and welcome back to the Geodynamics video lectures on brittle deformation and faulting. Here in lecture two we're going to talk about plasticity. And in our discussion of plasticity we're going to start with the perfectly plastic behavior and then talk about a combination of rock deformation mechanisms called elastic perfectly plastic behavior. Now We've already seen for elasticity this kind of um, plot where here we had on the vertical axis uh, stress and here on the horizontal axis for perfect plasticity we have the strain rate and so you can see the dot on top of the epsilon there which indicates it is a strain rate. The relationship for perfectly plastic behavior says that we require a constant stress for deformation. And so you can see here this sigma y is called the yield stress. That's the stress that must be met in order for this material to deform. And once you meet that stress, you can deform um, at any strain rate at a constant level of stress. Now, what that means is that there's no deformation prior to reaching the yield stress. So unlike elastic behavior where we saw that there was a linear relationship between the stress and strain, here until you reach the yield stress there is no deformation. Once you reach that yield stress however you can deform the material an infinite amount as long as the stress equals or exceeds the yield stress. And so you can see that kind of relationship shown here mathematically that if the stress is less than the yield stress no deformation. If it's equal to the yield stress we have what's called failure in the rock or fracturing and an infinite amount of deformation is possible. This is non-recoverable deformation and the picture you can think about is maybe a block being pulled across a table. Um, normally I would put you know a textbook or something like that and pull on it and the initial pull that I give if it's not enough to get the book to move that means I haven't reached the state at which deformation would occur, and then if I pull a bit harder, eventually I can reach the equivalent of the yield stress. If we look at this then in the kind of plots that we've seen already before here, showing stress versus time, and then the average strain versus time, you can see that in the period between one and two, where we're below the yield stress, there is no deformation. Between two and three, where we're at the yield stress, you can see that there is kind of any amount of strain you want to have possible. It depends on how fast you're pulling, but as long as you're at the yield stress or above, you can continue to deform. And once you go back down below the yield stress, that deformation stays there. That's why the strain value doesn't drop back down like it does for elastic behavior. Now, we can combine these things as well. So I've already mentioned this is kind of where we're going. And so for you, I'd like you to take a moment and pause the video and think about what would the deformation look like if you combine elastic and perfectly plastic behavior in a material? So take a moment, pause the video, and when you come back, we'll see whether your idea is the same thing we're going to present. Okay, so hopefully you've come up with something. Elastically or elastic, perfectly plastic behavior is basically a combination of those two deformation mechanisms. So we'll have some part that should be elastic, some part that should be perfectly plastic. Here if we look at our plot we have the normal stress and then along here is the mean strain, normal strain. And you can see just like you would expect for a linear or for an elastic material, you have this initial linear relationship where increasing stress results in increasing strain until you reach the plastic yield stress, at which point this relationship then flattens out because you can't go above the yield stress. Once the material becomes plastic, it will stay at that yield stress value. And so there's a component here that's elastic and a component here that is plastic. If we look at the strain rate, the strain rate in this case could be the same for the entire time. It's just there's a certain amount of strain that's plastic and then a certain amount of strain that is elastic. In this case you could think about 
if we went back to the textbook example of pulling a textbook along, it would basically be like pulling a textbook along with a rubber band. And so you'd have the rubber band that would stretch at first and the textbook would just sit there until eventually the stress becomes high enough that the book then begins to slide along on the table. Now, if we look again at these plots of stress versus time and strain versus time, what you can see here initially is between time one and two an increasing value of normal stress, but staying below the yield stress until point two. And just like you would expect for an elastic material, you have a linear relationship in the strain. This would basically be the rubber band stretching part. Then between time two and three where you're at the yield stress, again, you can have any kind of arbitrary slope you want. The strain rate doesn't really um, come in here. It's simply, if you're at the yield stress, you can slide the book along as far as you please. Then when you, between times three and four, decrease your stress from the yield stress back down to zero, you can see that just like you'd expect for an elastic material, there is this elastic relaxation. The recovery of the elastic part of the deformation, but in the end, you're left with some amount of permanent deformation that is a result of the plastic part of the deformation. So this is basically a combination of the two um, deformation mechanisms. And uh, if it's Confusing to you, I suggest go back and just rewatch this part of the lecture, and you'll see it really is simply a combination. The reason that this is an important combination to talk about is that this is basically how we think faults work during the earthquake cycle. So if you take a place like the western U.S. with the San Andreas Fault, we have continual movement, continual tectonic movement between the two plates on either side of the fault, but we don't have earthquakes all the time. We have this certain amount of elastic deformation that's building up, building up, building up, and the stress within the fault zone is also increasing the whole time that the elastic strain and the elastic stress are building. Now, when you reach the critical stress state, effectively the yield stress for the fault zone, that's when you have slip and an earthquake and you then recover some of the elastic uh, deformation and you start the cycle again of building elastic deformation, building elastic strain up until the point that you then fail again and have another earthquake. So this would be basically, you know, the book would be sitting on top of the table and the fault zone would be between the two of them. The rock surrounding the fault would be the rubber band that's slowly being stretched. Okay, so we've talked now a little bit about plasticity and it's time to go on and take your quiz and then we'll continue on talking about friction in rock in the following video lecture.